Good evening. We're going to do something a little different uh, at the start this evening. I've talked a lot about the idea of uh, God's rest, what that means, and I don't know that I'm the best at explaining that, but I've got a part of a lectureship from Harding. It's just a few minutes long, so I was going to let you watch this. Um, this guy is, uh, his name eludes me at the minute, but this is from four or five years ago, but he's an Old Testament guy, Hebrew guy, and um, he kind of explains a little better, because we're in Hebrews, and you got to remember, we're just not Jews, you know, and we don't really, all, we're not Old Testament people. We don't really have that kind of mindset, and that makes a difference when you read a book like Hebrews. So um, are you able to pause this? As, you can pause this as we go, right? Pause this video. So we'll probably do that some, but. And then I'll try maybe to help you a little bit with what's going on. But anyway, I thought this might be kind of interesting to you uh, since where we're at in the book of Hebrews, talking about Melchizedek and temples and all those other things that we're dealing with right now. Go ahead, honey, or go ahead, Shannon. I guess it's Shannon. Cosmos' temple. Boy, I've got to move fast. Sorry. Uh, you doing all right? Okay. Cosmos' temple. Okay. When we read Genesis 1, we get to day 7, and we think that, oh, okay, we reached the end. This is the end music, as my father used to call it in the movies. You know, it's just kind of tying things up here, a little uh, theological footnote, and we're all taken care of here. Uh, the real creation takes place in days 1 through 6. Day 7, ah, you know, okay, God rested, whatever in the world that means, okay? Well, no, not okay. An ancient reading the text has a totally different response. An ancient reading of the text says, oh, this is a temple text. And you say, say what? Uh, where'd you get that? I don't see the word temple anywhere in sight. He said, it's easy. God rested. Okay, I'm not with you. God's rest in temples. That's the only place God's rest, in temples. In fact, that's what temples are built for, for God's to rest in. If God's resting, this is a temple text. We'd never see that. High context. We're not in that circle of communication. We've got some catching up to do. Okay, that's an ancient temple text there. Rest is the main goal of creation. People may be the climax of the six days, but rest is the climax of the creation account. This is a temple text. God, I'm proposing, is setting up the cosmos as sacred space which is marked by his presence. That's what we call a temple. God is setting up sacred space for his occupation. If God's not there, it's not sacred space. And all of the passage is meaningless. He sets it up to work for people. He doesn't need it. But he sets it up as sacred space. That means he's in it. And if you miss that, you miss what Genesis 1 is all about. Because this is not just about a cosmos full of material stuff. It's about a cosmos that is sacred space, working for people with God in it to relate to these people that he has created. The temple is constructed as a microcosmos. I can't go into the details. Look at Psalm 132. Let us go to his dwelling place, temple. Let us worship at his footstool, the ark. Arise, O Lord, come to your resting place. That's where the temple is. For you and the ark of your might. For the Lord has chosen Zion. He has desired it for his dwelling. Okay, temple. This is my resting place. Okay, now we get the, the clincher. Forever and ever, here I will sit enthroned. We think of God resting as kind of kicking back. Okay, I've had a hard week creating things. Well, I'm just going to take a breather here. We know that's not true, but we don't know what else to say. This tells us what to say. When God rests, it means he has taken up his place there, his throne. His rest is his rule. Rest means everything has been brought under his control so that now what becomes normal can proceed. God is ruling in his place. When God says he's going to bring rest to Israel from her enemies all around, he's not saying so you can watch Sunday afternoon football or so you can kind of sit back and have a cool drink. 
He gives them rest, which means he brings them stability, equilibrium, so that they can live their lives. That's what rest is. And Hebrews tells us we haven't quite gotten there yet. There's more rest coming in God's presence, in new creation. When God rests, it means he has created stability in this cosmos that is now operating for people as sacred space, him in it relating to his creation. It's his temple. This cosmos is sacred space. And that's what it has to tell you. It is functional, sacred space. The seven days then, we find out that temple inaugurations take place often enough in seven day periods. If we ask, why is this happening in seven days? It's because it's the inauguration of sacred space. When they built Solomon's temple, they had years and years and years of material preparation. And even when all that preparation was done, there it stands, you could look at it, you could touch it. Is it a temple? No, it's ready to be a temple. Only when God comes into it in a seven day inauguration process, does it become the sacred space it was built to be in a long material process. So the day suggest, word day suggested should be a 24 hour period, fine, but it's not a day for material things happening. So that seven days has nothing to do with the age of the earth. Age of the earth is a material question. Okay, so well, this is not about the age of the earth. This is functions, not material. Seven days is a temple of integration. The objects are not necessarily being made in those seven days. The days are concerned with bringing order, not making things, and therefore the seven days would have nothing to do with the age of the earth. We've really got to move here. So the text asserts that in the seven day initial period, God brought the cosmos into operation by assigning roles and functions. That's what I propose Genesis 1 is. I'd better stop there. Thank you very much. So it's kind of a different idea when Hebrew writer says you're going to enter God's rest. We've always thought, I always thought that, you know, rest was, was uh, what we think of rest. And all we were going to do was just rest. And there wasn't anything else uh, that you and I needed to do in that. We were just, that's how we were. But if you really look at this and studying this quite a bit, you begin to see that I was wrong about a lot of things in Genesis as a child and probably as a young adult. I feel like I have a little better grasp now of what's going on in Genesis. And when you really look at the idea of what God did in Genesis 1, which we've argued most of our lives and people want to argue with you about it all the time. Did God really create everything in seven days? Was it seven 24-hour days? Is the earth 10,000 years old or 5 million years old? Uh, those are discussions people have all the time. But when you really look at what was going on here is, you know, God created, God ordered in those seven days. It doesn't mean that things weren't already here. Um, you know, how long did God take to, to create the cosmos, create the universe, create the earth? I, have, I don't have a clue. You know, and I don't think it's important. I don't think it matters, to be honest. I think it's a mute point. You know, what did God do in those seven days? He ordered things, didn't he? He put them into function. It's function, not creation. And, you know, for years, I think I missed that. But then also, when you really look at this idea, I don't know if you caught that on Solomon's temple, right? Um, Solomon's temple, David started to, to store the materials to build Solomon's temple before Solomon ever was king. You know why? Because David intended to build the temple. Nathan says, oh, you're not going to build it, right? God's not going to let you build it. But David, you know, if you read through 2 Samuel, uh, David amasses timber and amasses gold and amasses wealth and amasses all these things. And when he finally comes to Solomon, becomes king, David basically says, well, I've, I've got all this stuff. You know, you need to build a temple, right? But if you really read the text, Solomon built himself a house first, right? <laughs> you know, Solomon built his house, right? And built his palace and his court. And then he gets around to, well, I'm, now I'm going to build a temple, you know? And so he builds God a temple, which takes years, if you read the text. 
And like he says, was it a temple? No, it wasn't a temple. You know, all the stuff was there. The construction was done. It was, it was, it was there, right? It was, it was a space, but it wasn't a temple because in order to be a temple, what has to happen? God's got to be there, right? They hadn't moved the ark in there, right? And so in then seven days that they do all these sacrifices and everything, what do they do? They put the ark in the temple, and at the end of seven days, guess what? It's a temple because God's there, right? God's resting there is the idea because God's rest in temples. So when you say in Hebrews, when he says, they haven't entered my rest, you haven't entered my rest, well, what's he talking about? Is he talking about, well, you're not going to, you're going to go up there and all you're going to do is sit back and you're lazy boy and you're not going to do anything for eternity and you're just going to sit there and praise God and look at the star, look at whatever you're going to look at and that's going to be the end of it and that's absolutely not true because it never means that, right? God's rest is what? It's where God, where God is. So when we go to heaven, we're going into God's rest. What does that mean? Just like it meant for Israel when he says, Israel's getting my rest. And like he brought up, was Israel ever at rest? What we would call at rest? Never, right? Never. They were fighting wars. There was always conflict. There was always something going on. God didn't say, oh, when you cross the Jordan, which is what the Hebrew writer says, you cross the Jordan and get to the rest, God's rest, but there was no rest, what we would think of rest, right, in that part of the world. But yet, it was rest because why? Because God made it a sacred space, because God was there, because God ordered it, and God made it function, and God said, now you can be here, and you can do what you need to do, because I'm your God, and you're my people, and I'm going to take care of you. That's the analogy of heaven. So, you know, I don't think we look at the Bible that way. I, I know I never did until several years ago. Um, I never understood it. I was kind of like everybody. You know, why did God rest? Well, you know, I guess he was tired, but that doesn't make any sense. Uh, whatsoever, right? And like he says, the rest is the culmination. It's the climax of creation. It's not, it's the end. It's the climax of it, is that now God is here. God's with man. So anyway, um, I hope that helped a little bit. Are there any comments? I know that was kind of quick and um, y'all totally lost on this. Is it something you ever thought about before? Is it, is it new ground? Are we hoeing new ground? I don't know. Um, yeah, yeah, <laughs> but it's a really, um, but you see it throughout the Bible, you know, uh, that idea of God's, even in the Old Testament, God gave them rest, God will give us rest, you know, so we, well, it turned into that, yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I think it was significant. I think it was God's way of saying, on the seventh day I rested, you're going to rest. But like the Bible says, like the New Testament says, or Jesus says, you know, was the Sabbath made for man or man from the Sabbath? You know, the Sabbath was made for man. And when you, if you really think about it, um, especially when you consider that the Sabbath really wasn't a thing until the law, right? It wasn't a thing in the patriarchal age. Um, you know, Abraham, Isaac, Jacob, all them people were never told, keep the seventh, you know, keep the seventh day. It was nothing then. You know, the Sabbath didn't become something until Moses was on the mountain. And then all of a sudden, when Moses was on the mountain, what did, what happened? We built a temple, didn't we? We built a tabernacle, right? We put it out there, we built a tabernacle, and then what happened? God came and dwelled in that, in the ark, in that tabernacle, all of a sudden. And now we're saying, oh, now we're going to have a Sabbath, Right? Now we're going to have a day of rest. Um, so I think there's some significance. Yeah. I think the six days are more about functionality than necessarily creation. If you read Genesis 1, it says, you know, in the beginning, the earth was formless and void, and the Spirit of God moved across the surface of the deep. It doesn't say God created the it doesn't say God created the earth. It says it was there.
Yeah. I don't refute it. I just think that that's not the purpose of Genesis is to tell us how God made everything. I, d I think it's there to tell us that God's here and God's in control and God orders things in our life and God created time and God did all these things and God created man. And like you said, there is creation in the seven days. Mm -hmm. Yeah, we are in Hebrews. The Hebrew writer says, you know, we believe God created what's visible from the things that aren't visible, from the unseen. So, I mean, there's no doubt God created. I don't, and, you know, I don't, I don't think there's any argument about that. I mean, obviously God created what's here. God created everything because God had to do that. Nobody else could do that. But I really think for the ancient people that really that Moses wrote Genesis to, I don't think they were concerned with the science of creation like we are. I don't think it mattered to them. I don't think they were concerned with how God did it. They were concerned that God did it and God cares for us and God orders things for us. Mm-hmm. Yeah, I think when we look, when we start taking the Bible and saying we're going to make the Bible a scientific text, I think we miss the whole point of the Bible. You know, the Bible's not a scientific text. I mean, mm -hmm. yeah. Yeah, God gave us, I just think that God, what does he want us to get out of it? You know, I think you have to ask yourself for that when you read the Bible. Not what do I want to see, what do I want to get out of it? What does God want us to get out of it? You know, what does God want us to see when we look at it? That he's powerful, that he's, that he's able to take care of us, that he's able to, to bend whatever to his will, that he's able to, you know, what does God want us to get out of that? You know, right? Yeah, and I mean, there's no argument about that whatsoever. You know that God created everything. Mm -hmm. Right. Right. Yeah. And I think it's a mute point because I really don't think, to me, that's not what we should be getting out of Genesis. You know, we know God created it. I mean, that's, that's a give me. Right. Right, but I mean, that's the only option. I mean, there's really, I mean, there's no other option. Somebody created it, right? Somebody had to create it. Anybody that thinks that it wasn't created is, is just impossible. It has to, it had to have been created, right? I mean, there's just no two ways about it. Even scientists today, you know, we don't teach, you know, we teach intelligent design now in schools. I mean, we're not saying who the intelligent designer was, but we teach intelligent design because scientists have kind of come to the conclusion that that had to be made. Somebody had to do it. It was purposeful. You know, there's just no other way about it. And whether you're going to put God in that, which we do in the Bible, or whether you're going to say it was intelligent design, which we kind of scoff at that, but I'm glad they're finally saying, yeah, you know, there had to be something to do it. Well, the reason, yeah, well, it really plays into Hebrews. That's why I use this because we're in Hebrews and Hebrews talks a lot about the rest, entering that rest and they never entered the rest. And, you know, we want to enter that rest, you know, and we have to ask ourselves, 
inherently, what does that mean? What is God's rest? Because that's where we're all going. I mean, hopefully, right? I mean, we're all planning on going to heaven. We're all planning on going to God's rest, right? What does that mean? You know, is it, I've always kind of wondered about that. What does that mean, you know, as far as heaven goes? Um, and I think it kind of helps you understand that, to me anyway, that heaven is a lot more busy place than what maybe we think it is, you know, but there's a lot going on there. But it's God's rest, you know. Like Gary said, we're going to rest from a lot of the things of this world because we're not going to be flesh and blood anymore. A lot of the things that plague us on this earth are not going to plague us there. Essentially, you could kind of look at it. We're resting from this, right? Resting from tears and heartache and grief and whatever, sorrow, cold, heat, pain, resting from that. But to me, to think heaven is this place where we're entering God's rest, but God's rest is a place that's full of activity is, is wonderful for me to think about. I love to think of it that way, you know. I just think you see it, if you look at what God's rest was to the Israelites, didn't mean there wasn't anything going on. It just meant I'm going to protect you from your enemies and give you a place to do. I'm going to be here with you. And I think, you know, you see that if you look at temple, look at Solomon's temple, the same kind of idea. If you look at even what the Hebrew writer says, he says they entered a rest, right? They entered a rest when they crossed the Jordan. But like he said, they didn't just sit back and say, okay, then we can watch football, right? There was activity there, even in that rest. So I don't know, it might not mean anything to you guys. But to me, I've always, I'm just being straight honest here. I don't know how else to be. To me, as a child, and I'd read all those in Revelation about everybody just worshiping God all the time and singing all the time and sitting before the throne all the time, and as a child, I always thought, I don't know if that sounds that good to me as a child. <laughs> you know what I'm saying? <laughs> I mean, I don't know. I mean, I'm all about worship and praise and singing, but if that's going to be my whole eternity is sitting there doing that, could be a while, <laughs> right? So I would like to think we're created for something more than that, right? And I think we are created for something more than that. And to me, that's exciting. It makes me excited about heaven um, to see what God has created us for, right? Have you ever really thought about that? What did God create us for, you know? Yeah, Yeah, and that's one way you look at it. Rest from this earth, rest from what goes on here. Absolutely. Yeah. Who else was talking? Yeah, there's a peace in that and a rest in that for sure. Right. Yeah, and I totally agree with that. But I think if you really look at this, and like I say, you don't have to buy into this. I, I think it's pretty fascinating. But it gives you the idea that um, when the Hebrew writer talks about entering God's rest, what does that mean, right? Exactly does that mean? Well, I think if you kind of put this together and look at this, it means you're going to be where God is. I mean, you're going to where God is, right? So, um, I don't know, something to think about. Like I said, I know there's a lot of, you don't have to think about it or agree with me. That's fine. I don't think it's important necessarily that we all agree, but I just think it's a point of view that maybe we'll stretch our minds a little, maybe make you think a little bit, you know. Because um, we was talking, I'll get down here in a minute, we was talking about how Jesus is different, how um, Jesus is different because he's not of that tribe, not of that Levitical tribe. He's, um, he's of the tribe of Melchizedek. He's um, that even in his ancestors, in his loins, 
paid tribute to Melchizedek. But the bigger part about it is, is that if there's a change of priesthood, there's a change of law. So when that comes in to, to effect, it's like saying, okay, so you're going to have to think about this for a minute. So you got the patriarchal age, Abraham, Isaac, Jacob, all them guys um, that were before the law. And in that period of time, was there a priest? Was there a lineage of priests under the patriarchs? Abraham, Isaac, Jacob. There was no lineage of priests, you see. Was there? So what did that mean? Who were... So when Abraham dealt with God, that's why we call them patriarchs, Abraham dealt directly with God. Remember that? When Abraham took Isaac to worship, as he said, first time we see that word, shakal in the Hebrew, worship, he took Isaac on the mountain to offer a sacrifice. Am I right? So Abraham essentially was doing the duty of a priest, okay? Even though Abraham wasn't technically a priest, he was doing that. God was dealing directly with him, and that's what priests did. Priests and dealt directly with God. That's why you had a priest. But when the law came, there was a change of law. The law came down from Moses. When that happened on Sinai, God says, all right, now we're going to have a lineage of priests because now we have this law, old law. Now we have priests. But what's significant then, if Jesus becomes our priest, which is what the Hebrew writer is saying, Jesus has become our priest, the order of Melchizedek, Jesus has become our high priest. We're all priests. The Bible says we're all priests, every one of us. But we're not high priests because only a high priest could go into the presence of God. Okay? Jesus has become our high priest, and because of that, the law has changed. Okay? The law of Moses is no longer in effect because there's no longer a priesthood for that. Jesus has superseded that priesthood, and that's what the Hebrew writer is saying. He says, there was still need for another priest to come, one in the order of Melchizedek, not in the order of Aaron. For when the priesthood is changed, the law must be changed also. So the law is changed. The law isn't, we didn't add to the law of Moses. We didn't add to the old law. We didn't morph it into something different. We changed it, right? And if we changed it, if you change your clothes, are you still wearing your old clothes? right? No. If you change the law, are you still under the old law? No. So when that law changed, the old law became obsolete. We did away with it. So we didn't just take Judaism and morph it into Christianity, okay? We did away with that, and we started another law, okay? The law of liberty, we might say, or the law of Christ. And when we did that, we did away with the old. The Jews wanted to just morph it in. They wanted to keep the old law. They wanted to keep those dates and those, all those things, and they wanted to keep the Sabbath, and they wanted to keep the sacrifice, and they wanted to keep all those things, and yet they wanted to be Christians, you see? And they said, well, if you want to be a good Christian... You needed to keep this too over here. You need to be circumcised, right? You need to keep these dates. You need to keep these feasts. No, because we're done away with that. We don't do that anymore. So you can't hold both sides of this deal. Either you're doing this or you're doing this. A lot of people today, Messianic Jews, they think they still want to do both. But why would you do that, right? You need to be doing the new because you've done away with the old. The old's no longer in effect. The old's been changed. Just like when you change clothes, you do away with them old clothes. You don't wear them anymore. You don't put new clothes over your old clothes. You take them off, and then you put new clothes on. Same thing with the law. We changed it. We did away with it. We're not under that anymore. So it says they belong he who in these things are said belonged to a different tribe. And no one for that tribe has ever served at the altar. 
For it is clear that a Lord descended from Judah, and in regard to that tribe, Moses said nothing about priests. And what we have said is even more clear if another priest like Melchizedek appears. So he says, Jesus isn't of the tribe of Levi. Jesus of the tribe of Judah. Moses never said anything about Judah being priests. Because of that, he's of a different lineage, a different tribe that's serving at the altar. Not the altar on earth, because the altar on earth is obsolete. Even though the temple's still going right now at the time of the book of Hebrews, and they're still offering sacrifice on the altars, it's of no account. Doesn't matter. Because the altar that matters is in heaven, not on earth. And Jesus is serving at that altar for us, not the altar down here. And because of that, that has changed. One who has become a priest on the basis of a regulation as to his ancestry, but on the basis of the power of indestructible life. For it is declared you are a priest forever in the order of Melchizedek. The former regulation is set aside because it was weak and useless. So the Hebrew writer is really telling them Jews here, because that's who he's writing to, he's saying what's former has been put aside because it's weak and because it's useless. It has no use anymore. Its purpose in Jesus Christ has been fulfilled. There's no longer a purpose for the law. It doesn't exist anymore because Jesus Christ was the fulfillment of the law. Isn't that what Jesus said? He said, I came to fulfill the law. I didn't come to abolish the law. Jesus didn't abolish it. He just fulfilled it. And when he did... It was done, right? For the law made nothing perfect. And I think this is where we start to shift a little bit. Why was the law useless? You know, he says the law was useless. Why? Why was the law useless? That's the question you have to answer. Why? Well, useless means it has no use, right? And the reason it does is because what we want to do is we want to get to heaven. We want to get to where God is. And the question you have to ask is, can the law do that? Can the law get us to heaven? Can the law get us to God? You see, that's the question you have to ask. The Hebrew writer says it didn't because it made nothing. The word perfect here means complete. Made nothing complete. In other words, we were still incomplete. A better hope is introduced. He says it's been introduced by an oath. And that's probably a little bit difficult for you and I. Maybe we don't understand that as well as we should, but an oath in the Old Testament was a really important thing. And it says it was introduced oath. The Lord has sworn he will not change his mind. You are a priest forever. That's the oath. Because of this oath, Jesus has become the guarantor of a better covenant. So in other words, just like a contract, if you've got somebody that signs a contract and he's the guarantor of it, he's going to make sure it's fulfilled. That's what Jesus is. Jesus is going to make sure this new covenant is going to be fulfilled. It says, there are many priests since death prevented them from continuing office. So in other words, the high priest, he was, only, he was a priest until he died. That's how that was supposed to work. Now, at the time of Jesus, it didn't work like that anymore. That's how come in the, in the New Testament you've got Annas being a high priest and Caiaphas being a high priest. Because when the Romans came along, they decided the high priest office of the Jews was political. And so they started instilling, installing. They started, English, English is my first language. They started installing high priests, Right? Because they wanted to have political control over the Jews. And they knew the way to do that was to control the high priest. But originally it was never that way. A high priest was a high priest until he died. And then his son would take it over. When Aaron died, right, Nadab and Abihu were in line because they were the sons and God struck both of them dead. Right? But they were the next up because they were his sons. So when he died, they would have taken that role. But of course God struck them dead. But that lineage went down through Aaron by death. So a high priest could never stay a high priest forever because they died. We're out of time. Thanks for your time this evening. <laughs>